In our YouTube series about advanced Rust, we've finally come to the reason many seasoned software engineers switch to Rust. It is concurrency. If you're an experienced programmer looking to level up your skills and explore new horizons, you've come to the absolutely right place today. In this video, we'll explore how Rust's unique approach to threading sets it apart from other languages and why it's attracting so much attention from seasoned developers. From its innovative ownership and borrowing system that we've already talked about, to its seamless integration of safety and performance, uh, Rust offers a refreshing take on concurrent programming that's both powerful and elegant. So let's jump right in. Let us start off by looking at what Rust has to offer for us right out of the box in terms of threading. Well, it's not hard to guess. Everything that is important for threading or for creating a thread is in the thread module. And in here, we can just spawn a thread with thread spawn. What it returns to us is a join handle, and we will happily accept this one for now. And what it takes inside the spawn is a function that should be executed in this thread. Well, uh, it's very common to just use a closure here, so we'll have a closure. And in here we can do whatever we would like to do in this thread. So let's say we have some data that is created in the main function. And we'll say this is the best data ever. It's just a vector from 1 to 5. Now we would just like for an introductory example to print this vector in the thread. So we'll go print line um, and we call this print data in thread. And we'll just have it like this. Well, obviously this was a bit too simple and things didn't just work out. We have squiggly lines here under our capture clause of the closure. It says to force the closure to take ownership of data, use the move keyword. Why would the thread have to take ownership of the data? That seems kind of weird. All we want to do is print out the data. There is no notion of ownership required in there. Well, remember that when we have a thread, this thread executes concurrently meaning at the same time, whatever that exactly might mean, to our main thread of execution, which is the main function here. So, for example, if we would do something like this, um, let other data is equal to data, this would move data into other data. What we see here is a potential data race, right? Because this print statement is basically racing against this assignment statement. If the assignment comes first, we really have a problem because data no longer exists. If the print statement is first, everything is okay. However, the thread is not willing to play data race games. It says, whatever I need in my thread, whatever data I need there, you need to move it into the thread, meaning that the thread wants to take ownership so that it can definitely know whether data is still valid or whether it has been dropped. So we'll just do as the compiler says. We'll move this data in here. With this move statement before the closure, every piece of data that you take from the outside scope will be moved into this, uh, into this thread, meaning you, the thread takes ownership. However, now we have the problem that we cannot use data outside anymore, which is bad. And what is even worse is if we were to spawn a second and a third thread, we have no way of using this data in there as well. This is where ARC comes in. ARC stands for Atomic Reference Counted. And the way you use it is you wrap your data that you want to share across multiple threads in an ARC. So we'll do ARC new and we will wrap our vector in there. What happens is that arc is a shared pointer and it does that like most shared pointers do via reference counting, meaning that it has a bit of overhead compared to a normal pointer. And this overhead includes the reference counter, 
which counts at how many places there is the shared ownership that occurs. So data here in the main function definitely is the first point of shared ownership. So our counter here goes to one. Then when we want to move the data into this thread, the best way to do is, it is to first make a clone. That's data for thread is equal to arc clone and we will clone data. And what we will then do is we move data for thread into this thread instead of the normal data, meaning that now we can freely use data outside and we could do this for as many threads as we liked. What actually happens here is that we're not copying data. So we're not copying a potentially big data structure, but what we're doing is, is we're creating just a new shared pointer, a new arc, which increases the counter to two. And what we're moving into our thread is not actually the underlying data, we're moving a shared pointer to the data into our thread, which we can then use in here to print our, our statement. And we can, of course, also do the same thing outside. So let's say print line, print data in main, and we will print our data. So let's see what happens when we run this. Cargo run. Huh. Not really as expected. We have only the print statement from the main function, but nothing else. So what is actually happening in our code is that while this thread is being spawned, the execution in the main function continues and the print statement runs and then the main function is at the end, which means our program closes down. All while this thread is still spawning and once our program is closed down, the thread won't be able to do anything anymore. So we have to have a method of waiting for this handle. And the way you do this is you do handle.join, which returns a result. And because I don't want to deal with any results in here, I'll just unwrap that. Okay, let's give it another try. And this time it worked. So what we're doing is we're creating a thread, we're spawning it, taking the handle to it. And then we'll say, we'll wait at this point until our thread has finished execution and all our thread does is it will print. And after the thread has joined our main function, we're basically back to a single threaded application, which will then just print this data in the main and we're good. Of course, sometimes you would like to have more than one thread. Actually, it's the norm to have more than one extra thread. So for example, if you want to create four extra threads, you could do it like this. You create a loop in which you clone the data, spawn a thread, let it print your data, and push the handles into a handles storage. In this case, I've just chosen a vector. And of course, after this, we have to join all the handles before we can finally finish execution. And if we run this, you can see that the order in which the threads execute is kind of random. They are basically racing to do whatever and the operating system is giving priorities that we can't really control, at least not with this simple example. So the execution order will be kind of random. So we have 0, 1, 3, 2, we have 0, 3, 1, 2. Like it's basically random. So you cannot rely on those threads to do their jobs in any particular order, they will just do it as fast as they can. However, all of the handles will have to join before we're back in the main function. The next interesting thing, of course, would be not only accessing this data, but writing to the data, so mutating it. Arc alone doesn't allow this. It does not have any interior mutability access. So whatever data you put in there is going to be immutable no matter what. The way around this, or let's say one way around this, is a mutex. So we can, inside the arc, create another wrapper, which is going to be the mutex. And we will need to 
import this as well. So now what we have is we have an arc wrapping a mutex, wrapping our actual data. And the way to access this is we have to lock the mutex. Mutex stands for mutual exclusive, which means that only one access from one point can never be done at the same time. So having our three threads in here, we will just try to write to this data store from our vectors at the same time. So what we need to do first is we'll somehow get our data in a mutable way. And the way we do this is by accessing our data clone. And then we will have our lock, which locks the mutex, meaning that whatever thread gets to this line of code first will say, I am now the only one who can access this data. And this is a function that returns a result. So we have to unwrap here. And now we can do something like data.push and we'll just push the thread ID in this case. And let's remove this line here. Whenever we go out of this scope, so out of this closure, the lock will automatically be released. And at this point in time, another thread can take the lock and push their own eye to this data. This means that all the other threads will wait at exactly this point until they can acquire the lock before they can then go on. We can now run again. And we see, in this case, we pushed 0, 1, 2, 3. 0, 2, 1, 3. 0, 2, 1, 3. 0, 1, 3, 2. So again, the order is kind of random. And in this case, we should, of course, also lock our data before we will read it from here. That way we get a bit of a nicer output. Okay, So this way you can lock a resource for everybody to then be able to write it. And this goes, of course, hand in hand with Rust's ownership and borrowing system, where you can also only borrow a resource mutably once, and you cannot have other borrows neither read nor write at the same time. The third and last concept I would like to introduce is the read-write lock. So with this mutex, the shortcoming that we have now is that, let's say, only one thread would like to write, while all the others would like to read. Of course, you cannot read at the same time that somebody else is writing. But all the threads that would like to read could do this at the same time if nobody is writing to it. However, this is not possible with a mutex. A mutex locks the resource whenever you want to access it. So what we can do here is instead of using a mutex, we'll use a read-write lock. And this is the RW lock. And in this case, instead of locking the resource, you can either do a dot .read or you can do a dot .write. So to have our example not change in functionality, but just change the syntax towards a read-write lock. We would do the following thing. Here we want to write to it. And of course, only one thread can ever acquire the write lock at the same time. And here we will have a read lock. As long as there is no write lock on the data, we can have as many read locks at the same time as we want to have. So as you can see, the result is the exact same. And to drive this point home, we're going to do a little modification of this thread. We're going to say only one thread should be writing. So I'll say if i equals 3, this is thread number 3, I will be writing to the data. And the others will just read from the data. So we'll have just a print statement, reading data in thread number. And in this case, we just need to read dot unwrap. And the data, of course, doesn't have to be mutable at all. 
And in this case, we're going to say writing to data. And in order to see a bit more clearly that the read access actually happened at the same time while the write access has to happen alone, we can incur a little sleep in here. Thread sleep for a duration of, let's say, from seconds, one second. And to know that this is done, we'll just have a done. And we'll do the same thing here reading data and will be done afterwards. And now when we run this example, what we like to see is that the three reads can happen at the same time, but the write has to happen alone. And in fact, reading data happens at the same time, right? We see that reading starts for three threads and afterwards it is done for all the three threads while writing to the data happens alone. And this is exactly what we know from Rust's borrowing system. You can read as many times as you want to, but once you borrow mutably, every other access has to stop. Well, that is the basics of threading in Rust for you. We talked about how to create individual threads and how to share data in an immutable and immutable fashion between those threads. However, we are merely scratching the surface. There is way more to threads than you might think. There is channels, there is send and there is sync, for example. That would be a logical next step. I will talk about these in an upcoming video. Until then, if you liked what you saw, give this video a thumbs up and maybe consider subscribing. Until then, I'll see you next time at Green Tea Coding.